Bob Bradley was the first American to manage in the Premier League when he became Swansea City's manager in 2016. But nowadays, his time with the club is remembered for all the wrong reasons, and in this video we're going to see why. I'm Joseph, this is Red Mist, and thank you for joining me as we revisit Bob Bradley's time at Swansea City. Before we go any further, if you could please like the video as it goes a long way to supporting the channel. And if you like what you see, make sure you subscribe to Red Mist and have notifications on so you don't miss out on future videos. Now let's get back to it. Swansea City were promoted to the Premier League in 2011, and under the management of Brendan Rodgers, Michael Laudrup and briefly Gary Monk, they were a well-run club with an attractive style of football, and even managed to win the League Cup and qualify for the Europa League in 2013. But in the 2015-2016 season, things began to unravel. Gary Monk began the season as Swansea boss, but after a disastrous run of form he was sacked and replaced by Italian manager Francesco Guidolin in January 2016. Under Guidolin, the Swansea's form picked up dramatically in the second half of the season, and they earned 25 points from the remaining 15 fixtures and comfortably avoided relegation. However, calling the 2016 summer transfer window turbulent would be an understatement. Since 2002, Swansea had been predominantly locally owned, but that summer they were taken over by an American consortium led by Steve Kaplan and Jason Levine. The group came in and promised careful investment and sustainability to build on the excellent foundations that had already been put in place. But the move didn't go down well, and the Swansea City Supporters Trust, who own a 21% stake in the club, released a statement expressing their concerns about the owner's long-term plan for the club. And their concerns surely wouldn't have been eased by Swansea's transfer business either. Swansea lost two of their three top scorers in the previous season in Andre Ayew and Batafembi Gomis, and replaced them with the Spanish striking duo of Borja Baston and Fernando Llorente. Although they were both good players in their own right, both of them were out and out strikers and couldn't fill the gap on the wing that was left by Ayew. And while Llorente was a success and went on to score 15 league goals that season, club record signing Baston had an awful time in Wales, scoring just once before leaving for Malaga on loan the following summer. But undoubtedly, the biggest mistake was selling their club captain and first choice centre back Ashley Williams to Everton. Considering he was nearly 32 and his performances declined after leaving, you could say Swansea were smart to cash in, but they failed to adequately replace him or his leadership at the back. The expectation was that Spanish deputy centre back Jordi Amat could step up in his place, but that experiment failed miserably and he ended up being benched by the inexperienced Alfie Mawson, who had just been signed from Barnsley after making only four appearances for them in the Championship. Despite their depleted defence, the season started brightly for Swansea under Guidolin, with a 1-0 away win at Burnley, but they followed that up with a 2-0 away loss at newly promoted Hull, and from there, things only got worse. Swansea had an extremely difficult run of fixtures and lost 5 of their next 6, and after a 2-1 loss to Liverpool, Francesco Guidolin was controversially sacked on his 61st birthday, and in the same statement that announced Guidolin's departure, Swansea's board made the strange decision of confirming Bob Bradley's appointment as their new manager, and that's where things get really interesting. Before moving to Swansea, Bradley had won the 1998 MLS Cup with Chicago Fire and done quite well with the USA and Egyptian national teams. His USA side finished second at the 2009 Confederations Cup and topped their group at the 2010 World Cup, but his only managerial experience at club level in Europe was at Stebeck in Norway and Le Havre in France's second division. And despite doing well at both of them, the appointment was met with a lot of scepticism. Bradley was the first American to manage a Premier League team and many supporters felt that he was given the job on account of him and the new owners both coming from the US. The Swansea City Supporters Trust also released a statement expressing its disappointment over not being consulted during the recruitment process, which surely wouldn't have alleviated any tension. But Swansea's owners and chairman Hugh Jenkins were impressed by Bradley's leadership, character and knowledge of the club, and handed him the job over other contenders such as Ryan Giggs and Marcelino. At Bradley's first press conference, he insisted his nationality was unimportant and played no part in him getting the job, and after stating his desire to earn the supporters' respect and raise the team's standards, there was more positivity around the move, even if Francesco Guidolin did gatecrash the press conference. Bradley's spell started off with a 3-2 away defeat to third-placed Arsenal, and while there were some encouraging signs, such as Bradley's game management and the offensive side of Swansea's game, concerns were raised about Swansea's leaky defence and their inability to defend set pieces, and this would go on to be a consistent theme of Bradley's tenure. 
An uninspiring 0-0 draw at home to Watford would follow, before back-to-back 3-1 losses to Stoke and Man United did little to win over the doubters. Especially because Swansea were hemorrhaging goals despite playing quite defensively. An improved 1-1 draw with Everton followed, but from there, Swansea just did not stop conceding. A 5-4 victory over Crystal Palace was entertaining for neutrals, but highlighted their defensive issues, and this was followed by an embarrassing 5-0 hammering against Spurs, where Swansea had one shot all game. That game put Swansea bottom of the table, and pressure was mounting on Bradley, who was also being criticised for making frequent changes to the starting eleven. After that thrashing, the Swans faced a crucial run of games against teams that were at a similar level to them, and the run started well when Swansea comprehensively beat fellow relegation battlers Sunderland 3-0. And if there was any hope that their defence had solidified after that clean sheet, it was quickly extinguished by damaging defeats to West Brom and particularly Middlesbrough, who had scored just 13 league goals in 16 games before they put three past Bradley's side. With Swansea slipping deeper into relegation trouble and the fans turning on Bradley, a reaction was needed in their next game, a Boxing Day fixture versus West Ham if he had any chance of keeping his job. But in what was the story of Bradley's tenure, Swansea conceded the first goal and completely collapsed, eventually falling to a 4-1 defeat with yet more shambolic defending. And after yet another poor performance, Swansea's fans had had enough and started chanting we want Bradley out in the second half. And they certainly got their wish. Bradley was sacked the following day, meaning his tenure lasted a mere 85 days. Swansea's board had initially planned to give him the January window to address the deficiencies in the squad, but the poisonous atmosphere that had generated around the club, combined with the horrific performances on the field, left them with no choice. After his sacking, Bradley said he was disappointed by the decision, and that he felt he wasn't given enough time, but after just 2 wins in 11 games, 29 goals conceded, and questions being asked about his constant tinkering and poor in-game management, it's difficult to argue that the sacking wasn't justified. However, a large section of blame must be apportioned to Chairman Hugh Jenkins and the board, who were responsible for the disappointing summer transfer window, the knee-jerk decision to sack Francisco Guidelin, and hiring Bob Bradley. After Bradley's departure, Swansea turned to Paul Clement, who was the assistant manager to Carlo Ancelotti at Bayern Munich at the time. Under Clement, the Swans managed to tighten up at the back, and despite a shocking run of form in March and April, they picked up 13 points in their final five games to finish seven points clear of the relegation zone. But the following season, they were relegated to the championship and are yet to return to the top flight. As for Bradley, he was appointed as the head coach of LAFC in 2017, prior to their first season in the MLS and as of February 2021, he's still there. Under his management, the club won the 2019 MLS Supporters' Shield, which is awarded to the team with the most points before the playoffs begin. And on an individual level, he won the 2019 MLS Coach of the Year award, so perhaps he's not done too badly. So yeah, that's more or less the story of Bob Bradley's time at Swansea City. I think based on the results and the way the team was playing, the sacking was justified. However, the circumstances that Bradley did come into the club were quite toxic. I mean, the owners coming in was controversial in itself, and then them sacking Francesco Guidolin didn't go down well either. Added to that, the poor run of form that the team was on, confidence probably wasn't the highest, and he wasn't given any transfer window to kind of bring his own players in. I think it definitely was tough circumstances, and I guess it would have been interesting to see him take another Premier League job to see how he would have fared. But yeah, you definitely can't argue with the fact that Swansea sacked him. But yeah, what do you think? Do you think Rob Bradley could have done a better job if he was given more time and if he was given the January window to bring in more players? Or do you think absolutely not? He definitely should have just gone probably sooner than he actually did. I'd love to hear what you have to say, so let me know in the comments. And yeah, this has been a review of Bob Bradley's time at Swansea City. I've been Joseph, this has been Red Mist, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Thank you.